China has a reputation for being a place where intellectual property rights are not respected. But as delegates here at the IPBC 2014 conference in Shanghai found out, that's changing very rapidly. In fact, most of the litigation undertaken in relation to intellectual property is by Chinese companies against other Chinese companies. Guy Pruhl from Trans-Pacific IP told Joff Wilde at IPBC Asia 2014 how much things have changed in the last 10 years and what is driving this increasing sophistication in intellectual property in China. Uh, in, in intellectual property terms, uh, we focus primarily on patents. Um, we've built, uh, when I started the company, it was really just to do, to acquire a few patents. And I quickly learned that I could train people locally to do things that I was paying outside law firms, many of them overseas, to do. And with that, I started building a team. And initially, it was to focus on doing due diligence on transactions or patent portfolios that we acquired. And then, as we acquired, we ended up acquiring some patent applications, so then I built a team to do the prosecution side. Uh, and then as we continue to go into what I call the patent development program, which was working with universities, which was uh, both commercialization and monetization type activities, then I looked at doing technology transfer and those types of activities. And so we built out a team to do that. And, over, and then ultimately the last thing we did was do analysis, which was to get into deep dives on portfolios and technologies to understand what the real value was and what, uh, what could be done with them. So that's, that's how we ended up with kind of the full service team looking at all different aspects of, of what you could do with a patent here in Asia. Sure. And in terms of the way that the market's developed, you've been around for I think 10 years now. When you compare the Asian IP marketplace in 2004 to 2014, what would you say are the major differences? Oh, it's a completely different landscape than it was then. Uh, to be honest, in 2004, I was convincing people that they should sell patents to me. Now, that no need to convince them of that. It's, it's, it's everything else. In patent strategies, we didn't talk about patent strategies back then. There really weren't any. Uh, as far as pricing and valuations, I, I, I'd be... I, I think if people knew how, how much I'd paid for some patents in the early days, they, they'd... <laughs> It wince because it was some, some very cheap valuations back then and I just happened to be in kind of the right place at the right time. I, I had no idea when I started the company that there'd be such a big demand and there were so many patents available that were of pretty good quality or even high quality in some cases and some standard essential uh, patents that were just available to be purchased. I mean, I don't think anybody had even tried to do that in Asia before. Yeah. And what's, been, what's driven the change? What's driven the way in which people have reassessed IP strategy in Asia? Uh, I think a number of things have pushed it that direction. Certainly there's, there's a lot more press around patents. Um, there's a lot more litigation that has happened over the years. And I think as people started to enter into the U.S. marketplace, certainly in, in Taiwan and Japan they experienced that. Korea started to experience it. China's experienced it now. Um, where the need for a good, strong patent portfolio, it's just, it's, it's becoming more common place in, in the world and in business that you need to understand how to protect your technology. And so all these different things I think have kind of pulled together to, to force companies, CEOs, boards, senior managers to look at, at intellectual property in a completely different light than they did 10 years ago. And that's been exciting to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean I'm talking about an Asian market, but I wonder if it's actually the wrong way to look at it, that you should look at on a country by country basis and needs and priorities are different in different parts of Asia. Would that be a fair comment? It, it would be. I mean, each, each market is somewhat different. They're the, they're the same and they're different. Uh, you know, how you uh, try to get a transaction done in China does tend to be a little bit different than, say, in Japan or Korea or, or in Taiwan. And, and there's some of the uh, people today have talked about relationships, and it is a relationship based business over here in Asia. But, but really, each country has its kind of a unique approach to IP and, and what's, inter, you know, what's important to them, what's not important to them. One thing that's important to everyone is generally price and making sure that they get what they pay for and, and understanding that they've got some good patents that they can do something with. Now, the monetization aspect of that, of, of, you know, what can they do and how can they get money out of it, that's still something that I think we're on the very beginning of, of many companies here in Asia, really understanding what that means. Yeah. So a lot, of the, a lot of the work you've done up to now, it seems to me, has been much more about companies looking to purchase and create freedom to operate in, in new markets. Would that, would that be a fair comment? That would be. That, I would say the first six, seven, eight years of the company, that was our primary focus, was just helping people acquire and in some cases sell their technology uh, or their patents um, here in Asia. Uh, a lot of times we bought patents overseas as well. The last three to four years, 
we've done a lot more along the lines of patent strategy, understanding what to do with a patent portfolio, how to maximize the value, and how to really educate um, different, whether it be an entrepreneur or an individual inventor, all the way up to uh, major multinationals on what can be done on a particular transaction or on a particular portfolio. And in terms of the level of sophistication that you see in Asia as compared to say the United States or Europe, how would you, how would you say they compare? Uh, over the years, it's, it's been a, a big change there as well. Um, I would say recently you can, you can stack them up side by side in many cases. Uh, there are some things that are not quite there yet. Um, we still see uh, a, a license agreement or a patent transaction, a patent purchase agreement or a sale agreement. Those tend to be a little bit more challenging to get done in, in, in Asia than they are, say, with some of the European and U.S. companies that are very familiar and they've done it many times. Um, but on the other hand, um, they're, they're willing to get in there. They, they ask a lot of key questions now. And the sophistication is, is definitely up there on a global scale across the board in, in Asia. There's, the smaller companies, I think, are the ones that we're, they're still trying to come up and understand what they can do with it. Yeah. So <clears throat> looking at developments in the United States and also in Europe, in, in the U.S., you've had the America Invents Act. You've got the whole debate around patent reform. There's been some recent decisions from the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court, which some people have said have made patents less valuable. In Europe, you've got the development of the unitary system, the unified patent court. How, how are those things affecting Asian IP strategies? I think the biggest impact that they've had on strategies is, if you look at it from a patent holder standpoint, and whether you're acquiring or you're trying to license or you're taking a license, I think it's given everyone a little bit of pause on, you know, are they really getting the right value if they're a, lic a licensor, or if a licensee, are we paying, overpaying? So you've, you've seen some of those discussions and negotiations, I've seen those be dragged out, um, where I think a potential licensee looks at what other options do they have? How much, what's the cost of those other options? Is it possible for us to wait and see a, a better license uh, agreement that we can negotiate a year from now than negotiate yeah. today. So yeah. all these things tend to put a, a little bit of doubt in, in the monetization half of it. And, and ultimately the patent holders are the ones that are kind of getting hit with, with yeah. a lot of this now. Now some of those court decisions, they have directly impacted the value of certain types of patents or a certain type of technology. Um, but generally speaking, patent values have stayed relatively stable through even a, what I would call a down market in the IP. And earlier on in, in the session that we were both in, you were talking about people becoming much more interested in Chinese patents. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I think in, it, we've had a lot more interest from foreign companies on, on Chinese patents and what they should have or what they shouldn't have or if they should be out there acquiring. We've had a lot of interest from Chinese companies trying to understand which Chinese patents they should have and whether they've got the right ones. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that is being driven by the increase in litigation that's being filed in China today, yep. and, and a majority of that, probably 95 plus percent of it, is China on China companies looking to present, you know, protect their market share. Yep. I think foreign companies are interested in how can they play in that and help protect some of theirs. I think that's still a difficult place for them to play. Yep. But that, I think, is all part and parcel of what's kind of driving a, a stronger interest in Chinese patents. And ultimately, over the last few years, where there's been such a big increase in patent filings in China um, and patent issuances, uh, people are really trying to understand now where the real quality is and they're trying to find those gems in the rough as it were in a yeah. Chinese portfolio. And, and what would you say about the, the overall quality of the Chinese portfolios that you're seeing? Uh, it, I'm not sure that it's a lot different from a lot of other portfolios that are out there, um, but uh, you know we tend to see the same thing where there's, there's usually a couple of good ones and then there's a whole bunch that are kind of middle of the road yeah. and then you've got probably close to half of them that you, you probably wouldn't put a lot of value on. Yep. So that's that's your typical makeup. Um, you know, I, I'd say if you wanted to see a difference between say a US portfolio and a Chinese portfolio, I think the ones that tend to be of real low value in the Chinese portfolio are, they, they tend to be very, very obvious. Yep. Not so much so on a US portfolio. That doesn't mean that the value is any different. Yep. It just means that it, it's, it's ended up being, you know, written very, very poorly. Sure. And moving away from China, you know, obviously you have the jurisdictions like Japan and Korea. Are there any other jurisdictions in, in Asia that you feel that people should be looking at and take, beginning to take notice of? Uh, I think in Asia, still China is the place to be focused. Um, I think to even some degree, 
people have started to pull back from filings in, in Japan uh, and, and Korea. It hasn't been as high a priority, I think, at least on some of our clients and, and even some of the portfolios we own, uh, that we, we file a counterpart in, in Japan and Korea, uh, yeah. like we may have had maybe in the past. Uh, Taiwan is kind of hit or miss depending upon the technology, it always has been. Um, but still, I think, at least in Asia, it's still, it's still China. It's okay. still the primary place where we're looking to find. Okay. So if I, just, to, just to finish off, to put you on the spot, a couple of predictions for the development of the Asian IP marketplace over the next two or three years. What would you say that people should be looking out for? I think, uh, I think we're still going to see it grow. We're going to see more participants in the marketplace. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my, uh, on the panel this morning, We've seen more people in the marketplace now than ever before. I think that's going to continue. I think we're going to see more transactions over the next couple of years. Not necessarily big transactions, but a lot more transactions, maybe of smaller size, um, probably focused on better quality patents. And I think everyone in Asia is focusing on better quality patents. And everyone's getting a better sense of what a better quality patent is. And that's, that, I think, is good for the marketplace. And I yeah. think we should see more of that. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. All right.